Well, good evening. I hope that this evening finds you well. Um, my name is Barrett Harrelson, and I'm with Friendship Baptist Church, and we're starting uh, to produce some uh, online materials uh, designed to help people at whatever place they are in life. This series here um, I've titled, When Fathers Hide Their Sins, They Lose Their Sons. Uh, and it has everything to do with David uh, as a father. We see David as a military man. We see David as a warrior. We see David as this, this great leader, and indeed he was. But very few people, if any, talk about him being a great father. Um, and David had a great tragedy in his life. And I, I've said many times I'm thankful that uh, my worst moments aren't recorded in the Bible for everyone to see. So this isn't a, this isn't a David bashing series. This is a um, learning, learning from some things and seeing where sin will take you and, and what it will do to you. And so we're going to try. We'll see how far we get. I'm going to try to give us an overview of chapter 11. This is where David's great sin occurs uh, when he should have been out at battle um, uh, against the, uh, during the Ammonite-Syrian War. He should have been out there, but he, he stayed home for whatever reason. There's been a lot of supposition around that. I don't know the answer. Um, I know at this place in his life, um, there's probably he's probably at the peak of his power and, and his leadership. And I mean, just everything has, has gone well for him. And maybe there's arrogance. Maybe there's, uh, we could speculate on a whole lot of things. I, I don't know that I know the answer as to why he didn't go. Uh, nonetheless, chapter 11 is going to deal with his sin. And so I, I'm going to have some slides here uh, for us to look through. Uh, I'm going to read a big portion of chapter 11. And then really the goal of this as we venture in this series, uh, which will be, I'm going to try to have these on Thursdays, uh, published on Thursdays at 6 p.m. Um, but the goal is to learn some lessons. What, what happens as fathers? What happens as men? What, what happens? And then not only what happens, but how, how do we solve some things? Because there are some things that David did right once he decided to um, get his heart right. And so we'll see some of those things along the way, yet there's still consequences. Even though we have forgiveness from God, there's still consequences that come out from this. And I started this series in at King's Highway when the Lord had us over there in Kansas, and I just I never finished it, but I know that I had several people there say it was super powerful. And, and a lot of these truths probably coincide with, if you've ever read the book, um, uh, Three Kings, it talks about the relationship between Saul and David and David and Absalom. Uh, just a tremendous book that probably has better insight than I could ever dream of having. But there are some things here that stood out to me that I think will be a help. So let's dive into this uh, this evening. Uh, we're going to look here, 2 Samuel chapter 11, and i um, going to kind of read some pieces, give us an overview, and then step through some slides here for us. So if you have your Bible, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 says, And it came to pass after the year was expired, that the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Uh, historically, my understanding is, is during the winter months, nations would just agree to have a ceasefire, uh, some type of peace treaty uh, that they would, for the most part, stop a lot of the battling just because of how extensively cold uh, it was and, and it wasn't really good for anybody. So somehow along the way, they nations just agreed, okay, during the coldest of the winter months, we're going to agree not to battle. So when it talks about the year had expired, this is probably sometime around the end of February, spring is coming on, and they're going back to resume this war. It says in verse number two, and it came to pass in an evening tide. Some people think it was the afternoon. Some people think it was later into the evening. Um, I tend to kind of think it was probably the afternoon. But whatever the case is, at some point, David took a nap in the early afternoon, woke up, and it says that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. Uh, David here is in the king's house. It's probably situated above uh, the rest of, of, the, of the city. Uh, he can probably look down and see a lot of the tops of people's houses. And there's been some supposition, again, we don't know all of the facts here, but there's been some supposition posed that 
Uh, it's possible that, that David knew that Bathsheba was going to be here in this position, but whatever the case is, he gets up there and he sees, it says he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Now, he, he saw her, and, and I think most people, I mean, you just, you see things, but it's, it's, I've heard it said before, it's that second look. It's that, it's that, that pondering of the heart that says, uh, I think I liked what I saw, and I'd like to look again, and I, I would like my imagination to start to run places that it shouldn't run. So there's a difference between seeing something, and there's a difference between uh, uh, really thinking upon it, meditating upon it, creating some desire in somebody's heart, and that's what happened. At the end of verse 2, it says that he saw a woman, but then it says, and the woman was very beautiful beautiful to look upon. And verse 3 says, and David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, somebody speaks up here, one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now this part of the story always intrigues me. Somebody has enough gumption to tell David, that's somebody else's wife. That's somebody else's wife. It, this is, isn't this Uriah? Isn't he at battle? Isn't, wh- what is, that's not yours, David. You shouldn't be looking, you shouldn't be thinking. Nevertheless, and it's not recorded for us between verse 3 and verse 4, maybe it happened, but it's not recorded for us that David even responds to that question. It's it's almost like there's this idea that I'm the king and I'm going to get what I want and right now that's what I want. Now as this chapter unfolds, what we're going to find out is this David looks very different than the David we've seen from the time that he was anointed by Samuel all, all the way up until this time. This David seems like a completely different person. And, and that's really the heart of what this whole series is about. What happens when fathers hide their sins? When fathers hide their sins, they they lose their sons. And what we're going to see in chapter 11 is David begins to behave like somebody he's not. He's going to lose his faith in some sense that now his sin has taken hold of his heart and it's taken hold of his life. And when things unfold poorly, he begins to try to take control. And who is that David? Where's the David that did so great taking care of Mephibosheth? Where's the David that listened to Abigail? Where's the David that when the Philistines, when he's moving the ark and the Philistines come, he goes down and he prays and says, God, should I go out and fight the Philistines? Where is this David that deferred to Saul for decades? Where is the David that said, how can I raise my hand against the Lord's anointed? Where is that David? Because he doesn't appear anywhere in this chapter. The man that, the David that appears in this chapter is a man who's walking in the flesh. It's a man whose mind is a state upon the lusts of the flesh and the pride of life and the lust of the eyes. This woman that he sees and this woman that he wants and this pride that says, I'm the king and I can have what I want. And these are the three things we're going to see as we walk through this section of the Bible. 2 Samuel 11 to 1 Kings chapter 2. He's going to lose his faith. He's going to become someone that, if you were to read any other chapter prior to this, doesn't look like the same man at all. Doesn't behave, doesn't act. David was the kind of man that very much listened. You look at his relationship with Jonathan and even his relationship with Saul and his relationship with his, his oldest brother. He, he was a man who listened and responded. But here between verses 3 and verse 4, maybe it happened, but it's not recorded for us that somebody comes and says, this is not your wife. In fact, this is Uriah's wife. And nothing is recorded that David responds. He begins to become someone he's not. Not only is he going to lose his faith, he's going to become someone he's not. He's going to lose his future. Uh, Bathsheba's going to get pregnant, and that baby's going to die. Who knows what could have come from that baby? Uh, If things would have been handled, uh, the baby would have had with someone else, or uh, in a right way, in a proper way, that future that that could have been or should have been or who whether it was with Uriah whether however that would have come out whatever it is he lost that child they lost that child just know you cannot circumvent God's word and try to get God's blessing it's just not going to happen and I have no doubt in my heart 
that verse 3, whoever this person is, it says, and one said. I wonder if it's Ahithophel because of the damage that Ahithophel has in his heart later on in this story. But, and one said, somebody came to him. And I personally have no doubt that this was a God-ordained question. Uh, David, here's a warning. Much like Cain, when, when, when he was caught up in his heart, thinking about his brother's offering was accepted, but his wasn't, and God sent this warning. Cain, sin lieth at the door. Now we have David, and, and God sends somebody, whoever this person is, and they speak up, and they say, um, uh, that's not your wife. So he loses his faith, he loses his future, and then we're going to see he loses his family. Many parts of his family just begins to be destroyed. And here's this, here's this man who's this great leader, and he's this great military tactician, and, and he has this great way with people, the relationship he had with, with Jonathan, and how he behaved himself with, with Samuel and his brothers, and how he behaved himself with Saul, and, and how he behaved himself, I've already referenced, with Abigail, and all of these ways that he behaved himself with this great wisdom. And yet, somehow, some way, this wisdom that he behaved himself with people outside of his family never transcends into wisdom and in how he behaves and conducts himself inside of his family. So verse 3 comes, and we see that somebody says, It's not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Verse 4, And David sent messengers. Doesn't respond to the question. David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. Okay, David had his way. David did his thing. I don't know, in that moment, they're done. Uh, is there some type of, uh, of post-sin confusion, or, or is he happy about this? I, I don't. The Bible doesn't really tell us a whole lot about that. But what happens next is, in verse number 5, and the woman conceived. And I think many times in my own life, I think about, Barrett, your sin's going to find you out. It's going to find you out. You think you're going to hide it. You think you're going to cover it. But Barrett, your sin is going to find you out. It always finds you out. And it may not even it may even be that your sin doesn't find you out in this life, but one day when we stand before God, our sin is going to find us out. It's going to be revealed. And the woman conceived and sent and told David. She's going, uh-oh, we got a problem. And she somehow, maybe she wrote a letter, maybe she sent a messenger. I, I don't know exactly what it was, but she communicated this message to David and said, um, I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. In verse 6 it says, And David, now he goes into uh, he goes into this mode of trying to fix the problem. Okay, it's cover-up time. We've got to figure out how we're going to solve this. Now remember prior to this chapter, when David needed help solving problems, he went to God. But now, now that sin has taken hold in his heart, there's probably some subconscious that he has that he knows well, God can't bless this. God can't be a part of this. So we're going to have to figure out how to solve this. So he sends in verse number six to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was coming to him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, David was thinking to himself, I'll send him down. I'll bring him back from war, and I'll send him down to his wife, and the timing will work out well, and it'll just look like it's his baby. So David tells Uriah, go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. It's just this, you know what? We're going we're gonna to create a really uh, uh, fun and happy and party style environment. Go down and be with your wife tonight. And here's a whole bunch of food. And it, it's, from the, it's from the king, so it's probably some of the best food that maybe he could get his hands on. And this whole mess of meat follows him from the king. Verse 9, we see Uriah beginning to behave like what we would expect David to behave like. Verse 9 says, But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and went not down to his house. Uriah is going to tell us here in a minute why he did that. It says, And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down to his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? There, there was this 
uh, thing that would happen when they come back from war, and it probably still happens and today when soldiers are deployed overseas and they come back and they're with that loved one and, and they participate in those things within the, mar- the confines of marriage that loved ones participate within because they haven't seen each other for a long time. And, and David's confused. He thought surely he's going to go down and, and participate in this with his wife. And, and he didn't. And David goes, you, you came back? You came back and I brought you back and you didn't go down? He said, what? why, why can't, why did I, why'd you not go down to your wife in your own house? Verse 11, and Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in open fields. Uriah says to David, you know, it's just not fair. It's not fair. And I wondered to myself, in this moment when Uriah is telling this to David, I wondered to myself if he was pricked in his heart about doing what was right. I wonder if it pricked him to uh, uh, be more angry or if it pricked him maybe for a moment to humble himself and say, well, how are we going to get ourselves out of this situation? I, I don't know. But Uriah in verse number 11 sounds a whole lot like David. Is there not a cause? Is there not a, remember when David said that? Is there not a cause? I mean, he sounds a whole lot like the David that we have read about from the anointing of Samuel all the way up into this point. Is there not a cause? Was there a sheep that the bear and the lion tried to come take? And those little sheep, they, they, they meant the world. And man, I would fight them off. Is Goliath going to come out here and challenge us and make our God look like nothing? And, and is David going to come in and have this ability to play music to drive an evil spirit away from Saul? And is David going to know how to interact with his oldest brother, Eliab, when his oldest brother says, you've got a naughty heart, I know what you're doing out here? Who is this man now? This is a man whose sin is running his life at this point. This is what sin does. When, When fathers hide their sins, they lose their sons. That's the third point here. You lose your family. But what happens first is it changes you. There's a behavior modification that sin begins to apply to you because sin drives away. It it pushes away. God is a God of reconciliation, but when we won't reconcile our own hearts to God, when we won't come by faith and confess so that He can cleanse us, we start to become something we're not. We start to behave in ways that uh, are not ways that really show that God is our God and they're not ways that say we want to be Christ-like. They're they're very humanistic and they're very selfish and prideful. And Uriah right now sounds a whole lot like the David we we thought we knew. Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine own house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. Remember when David for a moment thought about he was there in the cave with Saul. He cut off a little bit of a screen. Now he comes back and he says, how can I raise my hand against the Lord's anointed? Where is that man? Where did he go? This is so important about this first step in this series. Sin causes you to become someone that doesn't look like God. It causes you to behave like someone who doesn't, who calls them, who doesn't, it causes you to behave like someone who's not a Christian. It begins to change your mind. It begins to change your behavior. And David said unto Uriah in verse 12, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him. And he made him drunk. David's thinking, you know what? If I can get his inhibitions out, maybe he won't be so goody two-shoes and he'll actually do what I'm trying to get him to do. Maybe if I can get him drunk. Maybe if I can get him uh, not thinking but feeling good. And the Bible says he made him drunk. And at the even went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. Personally, I think God intervened here in this situation so that David's sin would find him out. Verse 14 says, And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. So David writes this letter. 
verse 15, and he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. What has Uriah done here? Remember the, the man who came and said that, that he fell upon Saul? Remember the two that killed Ishbosheth? Uh, David was wrought in his heart and was frustrated that these men would do these things. Now David is that man. David is that. He's doing that thing. He literally sends this letter and he, that is going to be a letter that says, Kill Uriah. And he puts it, he has enough, he has enough gall to put this letter in the man's hand. And, and I, I feel confident there was some type of seal that was placed upon the letter that Uriah probably couldn't break that seal or else they would know it was read. Uriah appears to be a man, very much appears to be a man of integrity, that he wouldn't even think about something like that. And yet here he is walking with his own death sentence in his hand. The pride that has filled David's heart and he, he's behaving like someone that we don't recognize anymore. And he wrote that letter and set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, it said, and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city and he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew valiant were. So Joab reads this letter and he begins to follow through with what David said. And I'm thinking to myself, I wonder when Uriah handed him the letter. I wonder if Uriah was standing there when Joab broke the seal and rolled it out and read it. Probably not. They probably had some type of tent or some place where they went and they would read these letters from the king. But I wonder if Uriah, Uriah wasn't, he wasn't a slouch. He wasn't no joke when it came to being a part of a battle. Okay, you can read later on uh, about him being mentioned as a very strong and military man. Uh, uh, Uriah was no joke. So it's possible he could have been a part of that conversation. And, and I wonder to myself, how, I wonder in the moment if Uriah was there and, and Joab peels back the, the, the seal and unrolls the letter and he's looking at it. I wonder to myself if Joab is looking at him and looking at the letter and Uriah is standing there with integrity and character and obedience to the king and to the nation and to the Lord. He said, is not the ark and Israel and Judah and Joab, they're all down there at the battle. I'm not going to go back. He's standing there with this great character and integrity that rests within himself. I wonder if Joab's reading this letter and looking at him and reading this letter and looking at him. And it says in verse number 16 that it came to pass. Eventually there was a situation where Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew the valiant were. These weren't, again, Uriah was no slouch when it came to battling. Uriah was, he was no slouch. He, he wasn't a punk. He, he wasn't, he was a guy who could handle his business. He could handle himself when it came to battle. Verse 17, you just, you can't take, it's hard to take a whole bunch of people at once. So he, Joab finds out where the valiant men are and he puts, he puts Uriah down there. Verse 17, and the men of the city went out and fought with Joab and there fell some of the people of the servants of David and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war. Now, Joab, I have no doubt, I don't know when, I don't know if he read the letter and he thought something was going on, but Joab's eventually going to make it back to the city after this battle's over, and Joab, he's going to figure this out. And he's going to know what's going on, and, and, he, and he's going to lose a lot of respect for David because of how David conducted himself here in this situation. And I think we could all say that we would lose respect for a leader if they conducted themselves in this way, the same way that David did. But Joab sends back and tells David, and it says in verse 22, So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. In verse 25, it says, Then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee. He says, he says, tell, he says tells the messenger, Tell Joab that don't let this thing displease thee. Notice that word, displease. If you're reading along in your Bible, verse 25, there is a word in there. It says, David said unto the messenger, Thou shalt say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee. David saying, I'm not displeased as the king, so don't let it displease you. Make sure you remember that word, displeased. We're going to come back and visit in just a second because we're fixing to finish chapter 11. Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. David takes this man of great integrity and great character and basically says, Listen, a lot of people die. A lot of people die. 
don't be upset about it. The sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, verse 27, it's our last verse of the chapter. When the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. Now remember that word displeased. David told, David told Joab, David told the messenger to tell Joab, don't let this thing displease you. Don't be upset about it. People die in war. It just happens. Just overlook this thing. Don't worry about it. But he says specifically, let not this thing displease thee. But the end of verse 27 says this, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. David's worried about this situation with Joab. Don't, don't let this situation displease you. But where was the man that was concerned in his heart that the thing that he was doing back before chapter 11, all of the things that he would say and do and how he conducted himself, he was very much worried. Is this going to displease the Lord? Is this going to dishonor the Lord? Is this going to, uh, is this going to cause problems between me and God? And over and over again, David had this spirit of defer, 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 defer. And he had this great power with men, and he had this great power with God. Defer, 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 defer. And at some point, he gets to this peak of power about chapter 10, chapter 11, in his reign as king. He gets to this peak of power, and I don't know if the pride got to him or if he just let his guard down, but sin came in. And he wanted something that wasn't his so bad, it caused him to lose his faith. It caused him to become somebody that we don't recognize. And that's one of the biggest issues with sin. It causes you to become someone you don't recognize. That person you see in the mirror is not the same person that you thought they were. It causes people to second guess, well, I wonder if I'm even saved at all. I've said this before, but I pick up on little things that uh, uh, just body language that happens between me and my kids. If if the kids are doing something wrong, sometimes I'll enter a room while they're back there playing and I can kind of hear something going on and they'll kind of get caught in the moment. And when I enter the room, they won't make the same kind of eye contact with me that they normally make. Or they won't come running to me like they normally do when I enter a room. There's something immediately that in their heart says, I I'm wrong. And I don't want dad to know about it. David had that all the way up to chapter 11. Did he make mistakes? Absolutely he did. He was a sinner just like all the rest of us. And I said, again, this is not a David bashing uh, uh, series. I'm glad all of my sins, my worst sins aren't recorded for everybody to see. But there are some things we can learn here. And that's what I want to show you. We're going to look here this evening at when fathers hide their sins, they lose their sons. And that first step is they lose their faith. Now, let's talk about losing your faith. We read this chapter, and, and as I've said a couple times now already, it's who is this David that appears in chapter 11? He, he doesn't seem anything like the David we read about prior to this event. But sin changed his mind. It changed his actions. And sin is ultimately, as we continue through these chapters, is going to cause an aftermath that he never dreamed was going to come. I don't know if it was Adrian Rogers or who it was that talked about sin is going to cost you more than you want to pay, take you further than you want to go. Listen, this story is the epitome of that statement. This situation right here in chapter 11 is going to cost David dearly. It's going to cost him more, well, whatever two minutes or 10 minutes or 30 minutes or a whole afternoon, whatever it was he had with Bathsheba, there was probably lots of times he looked back on his life and went, boy, that sure wasn't worth it. All of, the, all of that pain, all of that heartache, all the things that are going to be revealed, the relationships with his sons and the sin and the, the lack of, of validity of what he has to say uh, uh, to his sons and how he deals with them. All of this causes these interpersonal problems. So let's examine David's uh, behavior patterns once sin conceived in his heart. I, I think, I, think uh, I hate to be legalistic about it, but if, if the sin didn't conceive in his heart in verse 2, it, it conceived in his heart somewhere between verse 2 and verse 3. It says again in verse 2, chapter 11, verse 2, And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off, the king's, uh, from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself 
And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. David should have just walked away. He, if he was going to send a messenger somewhere to say something or do something, he should have sent a messenger to put a decree throughout all the all of the city. Ladies aren't allowed to wash themselves on top of their houses no more. King don't need to be seeing all that mess. Don't don't. We need to avoid. We need to do something to put ourselves in a position to avoid situations that are going to lead us to sinful activities. But he didn't do that. So he sent a man to go get Bathsheba. Here's the four things we're going to look at, okay? Losing your faith. What does losing your faith look like? Well, this is the things that I see, and somebody probably smarter than me and, and, and more intelligent than me and, and uh, probably more right with God than me and, and, and probably more experienced than me with this passage could probably see more than this. But these were four things that jumped out to me. One, when sin had conceived in David's heart, he no longer listened to reason. He no longer listened to reason. And we're going to look at this, so I won't try to get too far ahead. But secondly, when sin conceived in his heart, he didn't like the results. He did not like what the results were. He thought he was going to. He thought he was going to enjoy himself for an afternoon and all the men are on a ward. Nobody's going to be the wiser. He thought he was going to enjoy the results of his sin, but no, he, he's not going to like the results. Thirdly, we're going to find out that when he started losing his faith because sin had conceived in his heart, his behavior pattern was he didn't live for righteousness. He was now trying to figure out how to cover this whole deal up. And he wasn't, he wasn't that same David who was going back to seek God over and over again. In fact, while I'm thinking about it, I'm, uh, there was a place where the Philistines, it looks like it's chapter 5. I got my Bible here. You probably can't see it. But chapter 5 um, uh, the children of David are born in Jerusalem, and then the Philistines heard that David was anointed king, and they come up, uh, uh, and they're trying to fight David. So David hears about this, and the Bible says that David goes down uh, into the hole to inquire of the Lord if he should go fight the Philistines, and God says yes. So he goes out and he whips the Philistines. They retreat. Then they come back. Now, me personally, if I was in that situation, they would have come back. I would have thought to myself, God already told me. God already told me to whip you, and I whipped you once, and I'll whip you twice. But he, instead of going back out to fight them a second time, if you go back and read that passage, he actually goes back to check with God again. God, are you still in this? God, do you still want me? Uh, they come up a second time. now, we, And God actually gives him a different uh, direction. He says, I want you to go. He, if you notice what happens in that passage, it's almost like a retreat, but it's not. But he tells David to circumvent and come up around almost behind them, kind of on the side of them, to put them in a situation that they get beat again. But the point of that story is, David repeatedly was going back to God, n not for big things, but for everything. His pattern of behavior when he lived for righteousness was that he was checking in with God about everything. He knew what God said on some matters, so he didn't have to check in with God about taking care of the sheep. He didn't have to check in with God when, when the uncircumcised Philistine comes up and says, send out a man. David goes, I know there's a cause on these things. But on certain things that he didn't know there was a cause on, his pattern of behavior was he was repeatedly and continually going back and checking with God. Now, sin's conceived in his heart, and his pattern of behavior is he doesn't listen to nobody. He's not going to listen to reason. He's not going to like the results. He's not going to live for righteousness. And he didn't look for the reaping that he was sowing with Bathsheba. So as we look at our first point here, he didn't listen to reason. Notice here in verse number 3, it says, And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David sent messengers and took her. That's the very next verse. It, the thing, and, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm uh, participating here in a fancy preacher term, maybe I'm participating here in eisegesis instead of exegesis, but there's nothing here between these two verses that David responds to this person. And, and I wonder to myself, if somebody comes and says, you shouldn't be doing this, it's not your wife, and David just goes, you know what, I'm the king and I'm going to do what I want. And this is what sin does. Sin convinces us we're the king, and we're going to do what we want. It's called the pride of life. I'm the king here. I'm the boss. I'm in charge. I'm in control. 
nobody and no one is going to tell me what I can and can't do. So whoever this one person is that comes and says, hey, this isn't your wife, I'll tell you what, that person can walk right back out of the king's court because I'm going to send some messengers to go and take her. And he does. He didn't listen to reason. When you start, when you start down a path, one of the key indicators that you or someone that you're close to, maybe a spouse, maybe your children, one of the indicators that sin has taken a hold. We're not talking about being, uh, uh, we're not talking about the kind of sin that, listen, we love the Lord, but we're fallen human beings. We're talking about the kind of sin that rejects what we know the light of God's word says. And we won't listen to reason. We won't listen when someone comes to us and says what, what Jesus talks about. Uh, if you got a problem with somebody, you go and talk to them face to face. And if they won't listen, you go and you get others, witnesses, and you go and you talk to them and, and over and over again. But if they won't listen. And Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians that man who was in this incestual relationship, he says, you guys know what's going on is wrong. Kick that guy out. Kick him out. In fact, Paul talks to Titus there and says, when I send you to Crete, there's some, there's some people in there that are spreading false doctrine and they're going in people's houses and, and they're subverting them. He says, go in there and kick those people out of their houses. Kick those people that are, are false doctrine and false prophets. Kick them out of the houses and teach people the right way. But David here was in this position as king. There was nobody higher than him. There was nobody that could tell him what to do. And he used his dictatorship, his, his, his kingship to get what he wanted. He sent messengers and took her. Listen to me. And, and I need to listen to me. When we will not listen to biblical reason, it is a key indicator. When our children who profess to be saved, to profess to be born again, when our spouses who profess to be saved, profess to be born again, when our church members who profess to be saved, profess to be born again, washed by the blood of Lord Jesus Christ, repent of their sin, it is an indicator that sin has taken, not an indicator that you're lost, although it could be, but as an indicator that sin has taken hold, we won't listen to biblical reason. Secondly, he didn't like the results. He thought, what he thought was going to happen was he was going to have himself a good afternoon. He, he was going to have himself a good time with this woman, and he was going to get away with it. But he didn't like the results of his actions. Verse 5 says, The woman conceived and sent and told David... I wonder what, I, I don't know if it was a letter or if it was a person or, or a group of people. Or, I, I've been told that the way that, that messages passed within the kingdom, you know, there was kind of like an inner court that pretty much knew everything that was going on. But I don't really know how this got communicated. But I just imagine if it was a letter, he unrolls this thing. Maybe he's sitting on the throne. Maybe he's up in his bed. But he unrolls this thing and he reads it and she goes, uh... We're going to have a baby. And he's thinking to himself, cover up mode. We got to fix this. We got to fix this. And people still do this today. Today, the abortion clinics have become so uh, easy to use and easy to go to that there's young girls who give their heart and their body to some young man who has her way with her and then he bolts the moment he finds that he finds out she's pregnant and she her parents are mad at her nobody's on her side so she feels this pressure of uh, this baby's going to ruin my life and now I've got to go and do something about it I didn't like the results this mindset of this liberalism you're not going to like the results we need to communicate this to ourselves we need to commu communicate this to our churches we need to communicate this to our children you're not you are not, you are not going to like the results of sin. You're not. It's going to be painful. It, it, there's a reason why preachers, uh, like our pastor, uh, why we preach preventative things. This is where sin is going to take you. Rest assured, you think that's going to be different for you, but it's not. It's not going to be different. It's going to do the same thing to me that it did to David, that it's done to many others 
better. David's a better man I could ever dream of being. I could never be anything like David. He was a man after God's own heart. The Psalms that he wrote, the language that he used, his love for God. We're not talking about a man who didn't love God. We're talking about a man who got caught up in his sin. He wouldn't listen to reason, and he's not liking the results. He didn't live for righteousness. Now, there's a couple things here. There's a pattern. Remember, we're talking about this pattern of behavior. It's interesting to me. I can't say this for sure, but it's interesting to me, verse 7, it says, David demanded of him. And I don't know if it's, if it's my culture that causes me to read into this, but this word demanded throughout the Old Testament is actually used as asking, uh, wishing. It, it's not the kind of demanded, but when I read this, I almost wonder to myself, I've seen this before, and this is just me talking here on this first point. I wonder if David was trying to get Uriah to challenge the authority that Joab had. So that maybe it would justify something in David's heart about what he was about to try to cover up. But nevertheless, whatever it was, he really tried, points two, three, and four here, he really tried a three-pronged approach to solve his problem. One, he comes up with this idea of let's bring Uriah back and let's send him down to his house. Well, that doesn't work. Then he goes, well, maybe we can get him drunk. Maybe we can get him drunk, and at that point all of his inhibitions will be gone and, and he'll go down to his wife then. That didn't work. So what does David do? David actually uses the goodness of Uriah against himself. He goes, well, you know what? You want to go back to battle so bad? Let me just sign this letter, seal it, put it in your hand, and send it to the hired hitman, Joab, so that you can be taken care of. You want to go back to battle so bad, Uriah? Let's create a scenario where you go back to battle and you don't come back home. And David's thinking to himself, if we can get this done fast enough, then it'll look like when I bring Bathsheba into my court, maybe it'll look like to everybody else, oh man, Uriah was such a great guy, and David really wants to take care of his brother's wife. And boy, the timing just worked out that she got pregnant. Boy, God really blessed that situation. David really took care of her. I wonder if that's what he's thinking is going to happen in his mind. But whatever the case was, we know, recorded in the Word of God here, David was not living for righteousness. There was a cover-up that he was trying to figure out. He tried to get him to come home to be with his wife. Didn't work. Tried to get him drunk to go and be with his wife. Didn't work. So David finally says on the third try, third try is a charm. If he wants to go back to battle so bad, if he wants to go back there and be with his boys so bad, let's just set him up to fall. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? Sometimes I ask myself that, who is this Barrett? When, when sin is starting to consume my heart and consume my mind, I ask myself, who is this Barrett? Who is this guy? Because he's not behaving like what the Bible says a Christian should behave like. Here's our last, our last point here. He didn't look for reaping. And I think this is so important. I tried to hit on that word displeased. In verse 27 it says, I should have had verse 25 on here as well. But verse 27 says, the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And remember, in verse 25, David sent a messenger to tell Joab, do not let this thing displease thee. But David was not looking for the reaping that was coming from what he sowed. You're going to reap what you sow. It might not happen as fast as it happened here with David. And I think that, I think the fact that sometimes the reaping for sin, it, because it doesn't happen immediately, something in our mind thinks we're getting away with it. Sometimes we think, especially when we're young, but sometimes even when we're older, well, it looks like I got away with that. It looks like God didn't really care. It looks like, no, I think it's just the grace of God, the mercy of God, but it's going to find you out. I mean, the Bible is just very clear. The sin is going to find you out. And you think, and I think, that we're going to get away with it, and you're not. You're not going to get away with it. It may look like it because nothing's happened for five years or ten years or twenty years. But rest assured, even if it's not in this lifetime, there will be an answer for sin. There will be an answer for sin. I praise the Lord that the answer for sin is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. But if you have not been saved, there's going to be an answer for sin. There's going to be an answer you're going to have to give. He didn't look for reaping. Losing your faith. He didn't, like, he didn't listen to reason. 
He didn't like the results. He didn't live for righteousness. And he didn't look for reaping. When sin is conceived in our heart, there is, we, are, we put ourselves on a path of our behavior changing. We've changed our mind. Our mind's not being renewed by the Word of God. So now we've almost, we've almost tried to take this veil that was ripped in two from top to bottom and sew it back together again. To build this wall back between us and God. That's what our sin is doing. And I'm thankful that 1 John 1, 9 is there. That David eventually does confess. He does get his heart right. But it's going to be painful. This is the biggest thing I want you to get from this. The consequences. Forgiveness and dealing with consequences are not the same thing. Forgiveness between man and God. Instantaneous. Consequences. The rest of your life. The rest of your life. Losing your faith. That's our, that's our first lesson here. When fathers hide their sins... They lose their sons. I, I've said before, and I'll say again here, and the Lord knows, but I have a great desire to raise a godly family. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge every day. It's a challenge to keep myself out of the way. It's a challenge to, to make sure that I, I don't have secret sin in my life. It's not causing relational issues between me and my wife or me and my children. But if I get to the place where I let sin conceive and then I try to the cover up process and I think that I'm going to hide my sins, this is, this is the truth of the matter. It may, you very well right now may think nobody knows and no one's ever going to know. And you may be sly and slick and deceitful and manipulative enough to hide it. But you're not going to hide it from God. You're not going to hide it from your own heart. And eventually, it's, it's, God just has this way. Sexual sin, God has this way of bringing it out. God just has this way of bringing out sexual sin. Well, that's kind of all the thoughts that I have here. Um, you, if you have any questions about any of this, you can see me at church. But if you happen to not attend Friendship Baptist Church, uh, there's the church phone number on there. I have a personal email on there. Our church website is on there. So feel free to, to reach out or if you have any questions about anything or any comments or anything that you want to add. If there's somebody that sees this and, and you say, Brother Barry, you ever thought about this? I'll try to bring it up the next time that, that we have one of these uh, videos right there. But uh, I hope that we would always consider, as what Brother George talks about all the time, consider that word. Ever since I've been here, and Brother George saying that word, it has stuck with me. Consider, consider, consider. Uh, I, when I talk to my boys, when I've talked to different men who've gotten themselves in situations, and, and over and over again I've heard this phrase, I just wasn't thinking. I just wasn't thinking. And I, I really believe here, if David could have had a window open to him to see all the future he was problems he was going to have within his home, I really believe it might have been a great proponent that would have caused him to say, you know what, it's not worth it. Is your family worth it? Is your soul worth it? This, this two-minute, five-minute, ten-minute sexual romp, is it really worth it to have this gratification for just a few moments and then you lose everything that the Lord has given you? Everything maybe that generationally your parents and grandparents worked so hard to give you by faith. I say work, but you, you understand what I'm saying. By faith, they served the Lord and they prayed and they sought the Lord and they, and they purposed and they did all of these things that, to pursue God and God blessed them. And then in just a single moment, we can throw all the blessings of God away, thinking that nobody's ever going to know and nobody's ever going to find out. When fathers hide their sins... What we're going to see, David's going to lose his sons. The baby, the Bible says it's a boy, the baby boy. We're going to see that David's going to lose Amnon. David's going to lose Absalom. And then after David dies, we're going to see David still, his family's in turmoil. Solomon and Adonijah fighting over the throne. And I think it's Benaiah goes and kills Adonijah. I don't know about you. I've, I've been fighting most of my life. I'm just sick of it. If we're going to fight something, let's fight the fight of faith. Let's fight the good fight. Let's not fight with each other, but let's fight on our knees. Let's fight in our prayer closets. Let's fight at our altars. Let's fight with our Bibles open. Let's fight for what's right. Thank you so much for joining tonight. Again, Thursdays at 6 p.m. is what we'll try to 
uh, have these things scheduled to be published. We may do them live sometimes, but I think for the most part, just because of schedules and all, I'll probably just record them before time and then schedule them to be published. Thank you again. Lord bless you. I hope you have a great evening.